Thank you very much. And thank you, Jeremy, and also to Helen, of course, for organising this session. Um, first in-person talk for a long time, which is quite a good thing, actually. Um, I'm going to tell or talk to you for a little while about uh, the excavation I ran um, together with the British Museum and Albion Archaeology last year on the site of, uh, at Hinton St Mary in Dorset. It's a research and training excavation. I'll tell you a little bit about the site first and then possibly and then at the end follow up with some reflections on the experience of trying to run in particular training excavation for university students uh, in the teeth of a global pandemic, something that I hope very much will never happen again. Um, we looked at a, saw a fantastic mosaic just a few minutes ago. Um, this is another remarkable mosaic from the later history of Roman Britain. Uh, for those of you who don't know what this is, this is the Hinton St Mary mosaic. Sadly, I didn't find it. Uh, it had been found before. It was discovered in 1963. Uh, when a labourer was building an outhouse next to the blacksmith's forge in the village of Hinton St Mary. Um, you showed a picture a few minutes ago, sorry I've lost the last speaker, yes you've got your mask on, I didn't recognise you then, of David Neal, didn't you, drawing the mosaic. There's, I've got a picture from 63 of David Neal, 59 years ago, drawing a mosaic, funnily <laughs> enough. And he came down to visit the site and he was telling me about how he got a phone call from the Ministry of Works on a Friday evening. So he put his pencils and his paper into a knapsack, jumped on his Vespa motorcycle, uh, motorcycle moped and shot down to Hinton and spent the next few days uh, drawing this mosaic. It's uh, remarkable. It's on display and has been on display since 63 in the British Museum. It doesn't look like this anymore. This is how it used to look uh, before 2000. Uh, then the Great Court um, redevelopment scheme happened and the British Museum decided to cut out the central roundel and put that on display on a wall and then remove the rest of it to the stores in East London and it's now move, going to move out to Reading. The purpose of the excavation that I'll tell you about is that the British Museum is in consultation or discussion with Dorset Museum in Dorchester to move the entire thing from Bloomsbury back to its home county, hopefully for the 60th anniversary of its discovery, i.e. next year. That was the plan pre-COVID, so we'll have to uh, look at whether that is actually possible. It's internationally famous and internationally important because of the central roundel with the figure with a cloak um, and the Cairo symbol, the Christogram behind him and two pomegranates to either side. Scholars are not sure who this man represents. If it's Jesus Christ, as some people suggest, then it's one of the earliest representations of Christ from the ancient world, and almost certainly the first and only representation on a floor mosaic from anywhere. It's possible that it doesn't represent Christ, and it might be the Emperor Constantine, or perhaps the usurper Magnentius, who was around in the <coughs> uh, third, fourth, and fifth decades of the fourth century. It was discovered by the curator of archaeology, uh, or it was f followed up by the curator of archaeology in the 1960s, who was Ken Painter, uh, who was a specialist in the late Roman world. And he came to uh, Hinton St Mary and carried out a series of excavations, what we would call evaluation excavations, uh, the following year. A number of trenches were opened up by him and other museum staff. Uh, in the area behind the forge. The dotted line on the top left hand inset shows the scheduled area. It was scheduled uh, late in 19, the whole area was scheduled in 1964. And Painter, on the basis, this is, this is pre geophysical days, of course, so on the basis of the status of the mosaic, he suggested and proposed that it was the main room, maybe the triclinium or something like that, the dining room of a large late Roman courtyard villa of which many are known in southern uh, Roman Britain. And he positioned his trenches based on that model, based on that idea. Um, you can see some of his trenches on the top left. And the results of what he found in those trenches is summarized on the bottom right. This is, the paint, this is Painter's idea of the putative uh, late Roman courtyard villa at Hinton St Mary. And it's that suggestion that he first made in 67 uh, that has gained prominence in the uh, literature about Roman Britain. Hinton St Mary and the Mosaic was, a, was the site of a late Roman courtyard villa 
Uh, and that's what the national listing designation suggests. Um, this is why this place is a scheduled monument. It misinterprets, however, Ken Painter quite significantly. He was a good archaeologist and he knew that what he'd found in his trenches didn't look quite right. So he put this forward as a possibility, but only a possibility. And he intended to come back um, in the later 1960s to carry out further excavations that unfortunately didn't happen, it wasn't possible. And in 65, the only thing that did happen was that they went back and they took the mosaic, they lifted the mosaic up and removed it to Bloomsbury, as I said, where it's been on display ever since. In the mid-1990s, English Heritage, as was then, commissioned a series of geophysical surveys, resistivity and magnetometry. No, they didn't commission, they undertook a series of geophysical surveys, the results of which you can see on the top left-hand uh, on the uh, top of this slide. The interpretation of that assumed that Painter's model was correct and what they were, visited, what they were seeing on the uh, geophysical results were the remains of this courtyard villa. So the idea was that there were these remains lying within the scheduled monument that at some point in future archaeologists would come back to investigate to discover the immediate context of the mosaic. And the moving of it from Bloomsbury to Dorset was the opportunity for the British Museum to undertake that. Uh, unlike in the 1960s when they could carry out excavations in their own right or on their own, in their own capacity, the British Museum doesn't do that kind of thing anymore in the UK. So I was fortunate enough to be contacted to see if I'd be able to uh, organise something for them as a research and as a training excavation. Uh, originally we were intending to go in 2020 but of course that was cancelled so we went back in two, uh, 2021 and opened six evaluation trenches across the uh, scheduled area in order to do what evaluations always do to evaluate the nature of the archaeology overburden and condition of the archaeological remains that kind of thing focusing on areas that the geophysics had suggested was that were the locations of stone-built masonry structures that somehow related to the courtyard villa. Um, what we discovered, I'll show you a couple of, oh, this is how our trenches related to Ken Painter's trenches, those in yellow, and also the geophysical surveys. There were already problems with this idea of the courtyard villa. The English heritage um, geophysics, for example, suggested that there were two long buildings, masonry buildings, as they proposed, in the area that should be the, uh, should be the courtyard. Um, our trench three, which I'll show you a picture of, uh, looked at that to try and resolve whether there was actually a building or a series of buildings there or not. What we found, in a nutshell, is that the interpretation, the previous interpretation is wrong and needs to be further investigated. There's no evidence for a high status dwelling uh, that the mosaic belonged to or even of a courtyard villa as Painter and others have proposed. It's not suggesting there's not a courtyard villa there somewhere, it just doesn't do what Painter thought it should do. It may well lie in other directions. The mosaic was, this is trench one on the left hand side, the mosaic was, excavate, was removed uh, in this part here so our trench one clipped the 1965 trench and extended beyond it and we can now be certain that it was part of a larger stone built structure. We have the wall that you can see on the left hand side of the trench that did continue all the way along. Uh, whether that's a boundary wall or a wall for a building we can't be certain in our narrow evaluation trenches but it was quite clearly uh, part of something larger. Other trenches, however, demonstrated that where we were told there should be late Roman masonry buildings, high status masonry buildings, there were no high status masonry buildings. There was Roman occupation, Romano-British occupation, um, floor surfaces and also yard surfaces, but possibly um, no indication of masonry structures whatsoever. This is trench three which does cross, uh, apparently, the two buildings that were noticed on the uh, geophysics. But unfortunately, the, ex the excavations 
um, show that there were no masonry buildings there. And in order to understand what there was, we need to presumably look in greater detail at the area uh, around it. So whereas I took, I'll come on to the size of the team in a little while, uh, but the van that we took down with all of our equipment in contained 25 or 30 large sponges that I thought we would be very much like you, cleaning off lovely late Roman mosaics. Those sponges remained dry and unused and unloved in the uh, site hut. Uh, it was mainly mattocking, shoveling and troweling and all the other great things that archaeologists do. We also saw in Trench uh, 5, or we also found that some of the anomalies are clearly post-Roman. This is an 18th or 19th century field drain uh, that was part of a, what, is, what is now a relict um, field boundary. So the geophysics, which can obviously give us a very good indication of what might lie beneath the ground, does need ground truthing. Uh, on its own, it can only tell us what there might possibly be there. We need archaeologists to dig holes in order to actually find out what there was. Um, the assessment report has been written and that's available online. Just a very quick summary of some of the finds. For a, villa, a potential villa site in the south of England, in Dorset, we, our trenches produced a remarkably small collection of small finds or um, uh, registered artefacts, 58 altogether, of which 29 are coins. Um, in terms of the bulk finds that we generated, um, significant and important assemblages of animal bones, some human bone and also pottery, but relatively small too. Even though we're only digging the evaluation trenches, uh, compared to other sites, we would have expected perhaps 10 times as much as the material that we retrieved. So again, another question to ask about the uh, interpretation of the site, whether it was or wasn't a villa. We achieved all of the objectives of the evaluation and we're hoping to be able to go out again uh, in the, uh, later on this summer to carry out further follow-up research excavations focusing, or research uh, trenches, focusing on the area around where the mosaic was discovered all those years ago. But for the time being, we can summarize our results as in we need to look again at the previous interpretation because as far as we can tell um, there is no there was no villa on this particular site um, and that throws up obviously a great deal of questions about what the mosaic was doing there who might have commissioned it and what it was uh, and who obviously was shown on that in the central roundel to finish off in the last five minutes, a little re few reflections on uh, COVID-19 and what it was like organising a student e excavation uh, in 2021. Uh, we all had to become experts at a great deal of things that we didn't feel very expert in. For example, writing COVID-19 emergency action plans and various other things. The team uh, at the top here, we're about 25 altogether six or seven staff and 17, 18 students. Um, we, there were a number of major challenges that we faced trying to work in Dorset. We were living in, under canvas in a village to which none of us belonged. Um, there were a group of people, we had come from all across the country. It was supposed to be a, a partnership project with two universities initially, Cardiff and Reading. About two months before the excavation was due to start, Reading pulled out, as they did of all of their external uh, fieldwork projects. I think they only ran one um, excavation in 2021, so there was a bit of last minute running around trying to gain more hands, willing hands to come and join us to carry out the excavation, um, which you can see carrying on in the, um, in the middle slide. The other major challenge was the uh, local community actually because Hinton St Mary has changed considerably in the last 60 years. It's no longer a working agricultural village, it's a dormitory village for large towns but also a place of retirement. And uh, there was a very interesting, um, and I use that word loosely, uh, <laughs> online meeting, it was my Jackie Weaver moment, an online meeting <laughs> of the Hinton St Mary Village Hall and Cricket Pavilion Committee 
which we were using. This is the village hall. It's, we're celebrating a birthday there. We don't always have balloons while we're having our lunch. Um, we, that's was, that was our base, and we were very grateful to the local community for allowing us to use it. Some members of the local community were less grateful that we were actually there at the time, and they wondered why the village summer fate had to be cancelled, yet all these archaeologists were allowed to come. Be, with an elderly population, there was a great deal of nervousness about COVID, and in particular about young people. And one of the reflections of the COVID years, I think, has been this pulling apart, perhaps, of the generations in our society. And I was surprised how unfriendly young and old could be to one another. Um, and initially, at least, we were, not made entire, we were not entirely welcomed by the local community who felt that we were super spreaders and we were going to start killing off the population of Hinton St. Mary. We operated in a bubble. We never came in contact with anybody in the local community and we were very keen right from the very beginning to make sure that was as clear as uh, could be. Yet there was some resistance. Thankfully, over the month that we were there, we were able to uh, improve relations considerably and I hope that they will welcome us back this year because we made such a, a positive impact. The other challenge that we had or that I faced was with the landowner. Uh, the landowner is a Covid denier and an anti-vaxxer and that caused me a great deal of soul searching initially uh, but in the end, we agreed that there were a number of topics, including politics and football and COVID, that we simply wouldn't talk about. <laughs> that was the way we managed to uh, continue. Two w I never knew if she was joking. Two weeks before I was due to put, pitch my tent down there, she phoned me up and suggested that nobody who had been vaccinated would be allowed on the site. And I sort of moved on swiftly and we started talking about politics or football just to try and remove <laughs> any of that. But we, but we made it. The other, the final huge challenge was with the students, actually, and with all of us. Because everybody, all of the team, uh, had been through 18 months or so of lockdowns and COVID troubles. And the elder, the older members of the group, my, I include myself in that, and Mike Luke, and Archie Gillespie, who we've seen before, and Ian Dennis from Cardiff. Some of us had health conditions that meant we needed to be careful. Um, most of us have elderly relatives that we were worried about, who perhaps didn't live in Dorset, so that caused a great deal, or that caused some um, discomfort, I suppose. But it was with the students that we could see the impact of COVID-19 most significantly. I've run a lot of research, a lot of training excavations in the past, and I hadn't realised how important second year students are. They might only have four, two, three, four weeks experience, but they are the role models for the first years who have no experience at all. This team didn't have a single day between them because those who were second years had had their fieldwork cancelled in 2020, and the first years were brand new. There was nobody for them to look up to and to emulate. They were also physically less able, capable perhaps, than students had been in the past because we'd all been locked down. But it was the psychological impact of COVID that I think was most obvious. And somebody earlier on mentioned, used the word trauma. And there were, there were a number of students who had been traumatised by their experience uh, at university, having been locked down in their rooms or their halls of red residence for weeks, if not months on end having to try to learn or partake in a, uh, an undergraduate degree online, remotely only. Uh, and one of them lived in a, the back of a van for about three months and was able somehow to carry on his studies with his mobile phone. All of a sudden, there are 25 of us in the middle of a field that we don't know, any, we don't know anybody. Uh, we've not really met anybody. And it took a long time for people to settle down and to realise that this was actually a, going to be a positive experience, not something that was dreaded. I had four or five of the team cancel in the couple of days before the excavation simply because they couldn't cope with the idea of being around other human beings even though we were going to be outdoors. So one of the things that myself and the other experienced uh, team members were able to do was we didn't have the same kind of pressures, obviously, that commercial archaeologists face. 
but we were so we were able to be as empathetic as possible. I'm sure everybody is, but because we were living with them and uh, eating with them uh, uh, and working with them, we were able to take things a little bit more slowly than perhaps we might have done before. To accept that nobody had any experience, so that was just something we were going to have to cope with, and to try and deal with everybody's individual traumas of which there were very many, to make sure that they stayed for the month. It was important for the dig, but also for them, that they saw the project through from the beginning to the end, and that they were able to get the most out of it as they possibly could. Um, and that took a great deal of work, and I can't speak for the other um, team members, but I only realised how much it had taken out of me when I went home. And when the dig was all over, I was absolutely shattered. I hadn't realised um, quite how exhausted I'd been. And uh, I slept for two or three days afterwards. But looking back on it, it was, I'm glad we did it. I'm glad we did it in the way that we did it. I'm still in contact with all of these people here. Uh, and I know that to a man and a woman, every single person that came is also relieved that they were able to do that. And that, for many of us, was a highlight of 2021. And for that, I think we, I, and my uh, fellow uh, project team members are immensely grateful. So, just a few personal reflections uh, to finish off with. Thank you very much indeed. <clears throat>